Okay. The time is 10 o'clock a.m. Central, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Let's see. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by our RPLC partner institution, the Rural Development Institute at Brandon University. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to go over some housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, our webinar will begin with a 40-minute presentation with a, a Q&A session to follow. So if you have any questions, either after the presentation or during the presentation, feel free to type your questions into a Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen, and we will go through each question uh, for our presenter to answer. Also, if you have any comments, um, such as technical issues, uh, feel free to email myself, uh, blatherwickm at brandonu.ca, or use the chat box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and posted on the RPLC YouTube page. A link will be sent to all the registered participants, and also a PDF copy of the presentation can be made available. Um, normally, I post these on our site, um, and I send them out after the, uh, the webinar. Uh, just a, also another reminder, because some of you may be dialing in or logging in from a rural location, and since Zoom is a web-based program, sometimes we do experience occasional interruptions in service. So if this does occur, don't worry. Usually uh, the program will launch within a minute. If it doesn't, uh, feel free to go through the same login protocol that you use to get into the, the room. And also not to fear because we will be recording it. So if there's anything that you have missed, we'll be able to, you'll be able to view the full webinar um, uninterrupted from our YouTube page. So I will uh, pass over the, the share to Dr. Dylan while I introduce him. Um, let's see. Dr. Dylan is a rural and remote physician in Saskatchewan and the Northwest Territories. He is the editor of the recently launched book, The Surprising Lives of Small Town Doctors which compiles stories from the front lines of rural medicine. Um, I actually should comment that the how we found out about it, our director, Bill Ashton, attended a conference and um, he also got a flyer from the Regina University Press. Uh, that is a, a book that they highlighted um, and we, we picked up on it from the Regina University Press, so credits to them as well. And um, I know many of you who have logged in, we have people from all across Canada, the US and Europe, um, know that uh, rural medicine is critical to rural populations and especially for attracting people to rural populations. Um, the availability of medical services is sometimes a very critical um, criteria of why anyone would want to move to a rural location. So it was with great pleasure that today we have today's speaker and perhaps uh, Dr. Dillon can give some insights on his experience with practicing rural medicine. So Dr. Dillon, let's see, we need to unmute your microphone. There, we are. There, you there you go, that's great. And I'll let you take the microphone in the floor. Perfect, can everyone see the presentation? Yeah, I can see it as, um, not as a, the, you know how you go, yeah, there you go. That's your whole, yeah, I can see the whole screen now. That's perfect. Okay, perfect. So I'll start. I was thinking about this last night and what I'm going to try and do is I'll try to be as, I think, controversial as I can uh, in some of my comments, realizing that they are recorded. Uh, but just to encourage some discussion, I'll try to be as kind of frank as I can uh, about some of the realities of rural practice uh, in terms of recruitment, retention. I'm going to be presenting so kind of some intro and a bit of a disclaimer. A couple of the photos I have here, they don't uh, directly identify any of my patients, but uh, some of them are a little bit graphic. There's a little bit of blood, I think, coming up this morning. Um, but just if anyone's queasy, just to keep an eye out for those, I'll try to give a warning and I won't dwell on them. I'm going to talk a little bit about me, about the, uh, the book, which I had to run back to the hospital to get out of my bag this morning. Um, the life of a, a rural doctor, some of the historical current challenges in Canada, and I know 
some of them are reflected in uh, I think quite a bit in the Midwest of the United States as well. And I understand we have some uh, viewers from there. If we have time and it won't bore anyone too much, I can do a small reading of my story from the book. And then uh, my research student should be logged in as well and doing some research on kind of what it's like to be a rural physician and recruitment and retention. Um, so I'll present some of the findings. They're, they're unpublished right now, so it's literally kind of not even hot off the press yet. And then open it up to some questions and discussion. So this is me. This is uh, the Saskatchewan book launch, and it looks really impressive, but I'll be honest, there was only two parents of a friend of mine that actually showed up to this book launch. The other one was um, was more well attended, but uh, so this book was two years in the making, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, I work mostly as a rural family doctor in Saskatchewan, but also in the Northwest Territories, and that's where I am now, in a small community called Fort Smith. And so, yeah, this is just another photo of rural Saskatchewan. So after I finished my two-year family medicine residency training. I moved into my uh, Land Rover, put all my possessions into there, and since then I've been actually technically homeless uh, and traveling and working as a physician since June 28th, 2013. In addition to my rural family medicine work, I also work as, as a physician in the Canadian Armed Forces as a reservist medical officer. So that's me do some cool stuff like flying planes occasionally. And then I did get married to my uh, midwife, Irish midwife, so I now call her an Irish full wife this year and uh, that's her there she's gonna come down and hopefully refresh my coffee if I'm lucky because I've never given a webinar so I know it's easier to be listening to one because you can get up and go to the bathroom or something if you need to whereas I don't have that luxury today so I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about the care of the sick uh, being a rural physician um, the first thing I I probably want to, to mention that I should talk about is it can be lonely. This is a photo I took uh, when I saw a moose wandering out the back of my rear view mirror once when I was driving. It can be quite lonely. Um, you, when you're working as a kind of a solo physician in a small community, uh, there's an incredible amount of pressure on you, especially when you think about young physicians moving out to rural communities now. And this is something I'll talk about in the research later on in the presentation, you're, you're all of a sudden after approximately, say, 10 years of post-secondary education, you finished high school, you've done probably an undergraduate degree of four years, then you've done your medical degree of four years, and then at minimum in Canada, you've done another two years of training in family medicine, where you're always under supervision, um, always have someone else to call, and then all of a sudden, you're out, and there's, say, 1,000 to 5,000 people whose lives are dependent on the medical care you can provide. And that transition is something that we're investigating in the research and just seeing, you know, how are people making that transition and what are some of the reasons that they're not making that transition because of the fear of working out in rural practice and just being alone. Uh, you do have nowadays more backup with telephone and we have helicopters and we have better road transport and ambulances, but there's still a, it's a huge jump to go from being a learner to being the physician out in, in rural small towns. At the same time, uh, there's an incredible amount of, I think, honor and respect that you get in small towns that you, you still do get in urban centers, but when you're a physician in a small town, um, you do get the, the hallowed parking spot in front of the emergency room. But it was, it was another physician who told me, he said, you know, you, you're walking around and people will come up to you and ask you, oh, you know, what was the test result or um, what happened with my aunt or thank you for helping a family member in hospital for this. So you do lose almost any aspect of privacy that you might have when you're working in a small town. But at the same time, as this other physician said, he could go into any of the five shops, not have his wallet and be able to, you know, kind of purchase what he needed and say, I'll come back and I'll, you know, pay for it later. Um, so with that responsibility and the stress, there's also a huge amount of respect that you get when you're working in these small communities, especially I find in Saskatchewan. So this, this is a picture I took for a friend of mine. He's actually from Trinidad. It says Black Drive, but I thought it said Black Doctor. And what I want to use this slide to kind of examine or just talk about is the huge impact and um, huge numbers I probably 
should say as well, of immigrant physicians, especially when you look at rural Canada and Saskatchewan as an example. We had huge numbers of physicians coming from South Africa in particular. Um, we have Nigeria, Pakistan, India as well, who have essentially shored up the Canadian healthcare system in rural Canada, and without which you probably would have seen almost a complete collapse of a lot of rural services within Saskatchewan. And I think it's true for, uh, I think there was someone from Newfoundland that came in. I think Newfoundland, the same. Um, when you look across rural Canada, the gaps in provision of rural health care have really been kind of filled by, by immigrant physicians to a, the detriment of the home country. So, for example, South Africa, I think, took out a full page ad in the Canadian Medical Association Journal years ago and said, you have to stop taking our doctors because we are solving, say, our problem here. Um, and at the same time, we're creating kind of a human resource problem in other countries that need physicians just as much, if not more, than Canada. So there is kind of a, an ethical imperative in some ways that we should be providing for our own healthcare services in our country. However, at the same time, you get this incredible, I guess, information translation between countries when you do allow physicians to move to different countries. They provide different kind of the, the same knowledge base but the the nuance um and then as well you can't really stop someone from moving to to a different country not necessarily the same parallels to kind of a, a syrian refugee or syrian immigrant uh in the current context but in terms of if, if a physician did want to move to another country um we shouldn't kind of put up, up barriers to that uh and we do in certain ways, I think, in terms of the examinations that we um, have fully qualified physicians go through. And there are programs to address that. But once again, it ends up being kind of a, a patchwork quilt across the country and very resource and government funding limited. Uh, a short video clip. So this is just to illustrate so that was just a, a quick clip I took when I was able to, to literally call for a helicopter to move with an unstable patient. So as I mentioned earlier, it is lonely, but we have some incredible resources in this country. Um, and I think STARS is now available in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, in the Northwest Territories, we have planes. Um, a huge, huge expense to run programs like this. Some of them are public-private partnerships. Otherwise, in the Northwest Territories, I believe it's fully government-funded. So one of the, the big drivers in terms of government cost, con cost constraints and small towns and rural areas and closing rural hospitals is, is just simply the cost of keeping them open. Um, with increasing urbanization and budget cuts, I think you're going to probably see more pressure on rural areas. I think one of the things that has been shown in the literature is having a full scope rural general practitioner actually decreases healthcare costs because you're able to provide that care at a lower acuity level in the community. Um, I have to go back a second here. Oh, sorry, I didn't print out my notes, so I have to go back for some of them. So this one, for example, I'm in a, a small town of, say, 3,000. Stuff that happens in the, the big city and you have uh, the emergency room physician and you have an internal medicine specialist there, um, you just simply don't have in small communities. So what, what I'm trying to illustrate with this is um, the, the drug problems that you have, kind of more concentrated, more visible in urban centers. You still do have them in rural areas with the exception that you as the physician have to deal with everything as the single physician. So for example, just this last weekend, I had to deal with um, a heroin overdose and someone who had kind of stopped breathing, brought in in the back of a car, two nurses on the phone to me calling me to come in and pulling this young lad out of the back of a car blue uh, and then having to, to deal with a heroin overdose in a small town eight hours away from a from a big center or any sort of intensive care unit, you really end up being on kind of the coal face of kind of the hardships um, and the difficulties that happen in small towns. Um, just this last weekend, I would have had to deal with 
kind of uh, two suicide attempts, and then you're dealing with the repercussions to <clears throat> not only the family who is very stressed about this, and then the person has to potentially go out for any psychiatric evaluation. Um, you deal with, if there's a, a murder, you're dealing with the RCMP, you're dealing with the coroner. Um, so it's just to, to show that even there can be a thought that rural life is quite placid and relaxed, but in reality, as a physician, you really see the, the more difficult and the, the hardships that occur um, throughout the whole community. And you as a physician are quite isolated in that you don't have an outlet to discuss that with, be that the medical side of things in terms of other treatment options or just going out into the community because no matter where you are, um, you always walk around as the, as the town physician. Um, this is an example. So this was uh, one of the first patients that I actually had die, and it always always happens on the day that you kind of think it's going to be a quiet day in the emergency room, and then you go in and you're wearing your new jeans. And I remember I always wear I wear sandals. I know it's probably health and safety not wise, but I wear sandals when I'm going back in and in and out during the summer to the emergency room. But when you have to deal with incredible trauma. So it was this horrible car accident with uh, an ATV and I had to go in and I was the one physician with two 20 to 30 year old females, one who was actively dying or going to die right there with me and one nurse and the paramedics were there with me and I could, I saved, saved, we saved one together and the other one didn't. But then you leave these incredible high stress situations, which, um, don't happen all that often, but they do happen in rural areas, especially in terms of trauma with ATVs or car accidents or drinking and driving still um, ends up being an issue. But then you have to go home. Um, and on your way home, you, you know, you're only five, 10 minutes away from your hospital in your community, um, but you can't, can't get that separation that I think in urban centers where you go to work, you finish, and then you can go home and decompress. That doesn't necessarily happen as much in rural areas, just because you are such a part of that community. Sorry. So this is once again rural Saskatchewan. It's kind of one of these almost ghost towns you kind of see, or these little ghost houses you see when you're driving around um, rural Saskatchewan, which is where I normally work. Um, there it has been, I believe it was in the 1970s or 80s, there was a big kind of mass closure of small hospitals. And since then you are seeing a trend to more regionalization, which in certain parts and levels of care um, that is probably beneficial because you're getting kind of that critical mass needed to provide certain services. Uh, at the same time, I'm a strong believer in either kind of the, that level of either nurse practitioner care or family medicine physician care, optimally, I think, in, uh, in these smaller centers just to keep pressure off the bigger cities. Um, and then there is that, once again, I come back to it um, in terms of specializing in everything. I describe rural medicine as you need to have a very, very broad scope. You need to have a large, shallow pool of knowledge, whereas a specialist would have a kind of smaller, deeper pool of knowledge. Um, let me see what time it is. So I'm going to give a, a small reading. So this is a photo. Sorry, it's a bit blurry. I'm a physician, not a professional photographer. Um, and this, this was a cake um, that I'm going to read a little bit about now here. So this is a, a patient, who, one of the first patients who I had who was quite young. You can see he's just turning 45. He had a uh, terminal diagnosis um, of cancer that had metastasized. And I'll just read here. His last birthday ever. We physicians are notoriously bad at predicting death, but I knew in his case. Through our conversations, I had the sense he would appreciate a birthday cake. He was a farmer before fighting the unseen cancer cells had become his full-time occupation. 
It could be that he had not had a proper birthday cake in years. He would have been too busy harvesting to take time for that. He had time now, but not that much time. I went quickly to the local co-op after work. I needed a birthday cake stat. The only cakes available were pre-decorated with icing, icing designs appropriate only for an eight-year-old eight -year girl's birthday, a girl who was really, really into pink and sparkles. How do you explain that you need a cake redecorated tonight in the last hours the store is open for someone who is going to die but has a birthday tomorrow without sounding like a complete weirdo? Also, don't forget that you want to decorate the cake with small plastic farm animals to remind him of home and work and the happy times in his life. It can't be that hard to find that sort of thing in small town Saskatchewan at 6 p.m. on a Monday evening, right? Somehow it all worked out. There remains, however, a very confused sales counter checkout girl in a home hardware somewhere in Saskatchewan who is still wondering how finding small plastic farm animals in the basement of a shop could be so exciting to the new physician in town. On the rainy morning of his birthday, I was able to collect a number of the nurses, lights and candles, and walk into the room to see a look first of confusion and then surprise on his face. And then the smile for a moment wiped the disease from the room and replaced it with pure happiness. One of the nurses reminded him to first take off his nasal cannula, blowing oxygen through to his lungs before bringing the flames close to him. Whew. I left before having a chance to try the cake with him and his family, but I stuck my head in the door that afternoon. I knew, he knew, that he was leaving. Thanks, Doc. That was the best cake I've ever had. It was amazing. You'll never know how those words made me feel. There was nothing years of training could have taught me to have made that situation any better for him medically but I would like to think I made him a little bit happier. His friend told me afterwards in the hallway that he was happy all day. Then he was gone. So that was just a small passage from my kind of story called uh, Death is Closer Here from the book. It is, I guess I should give it a plug. It is available on amazon.ca and we've gone to our, our second printing. Um, so I'm gonna switch tacks a little bit now and talk about our research. So. There, there are some people who still kind of talk about the decline of rural medicine. Um, for me, part of the impetus for writing the book was that I was meeting a lot of other young physicians who were like me, who were actually going into rural medicine, which is something we, I think, haven't seen in years. And it's a product of a number of different factors. I'm going to talk a little bit about recruitment and retention in a moment. So I think Emmett is listening in. So this is a part of a larger project. We have a couple of different parts of it called Fear for the Unknown Rural Family Medicine First Year in Practice. And what kind of my goals were in this was to look at what are some of the specific fears and reasons why residents in training or family after they've completed med school, so family medicine and doctors in training, why are they hesitant to go work in rural areas? Some, some are not, but what are some of the barriers to them working in rural family practice? So one of the, the shifts that we actually noticed, and Emmett brings this up in his paper, is that there, there has been in the past a large, um, I guess in the past, in the past you've had probably a more male dominant workforce. Um, and you see that a fair amount in a lot of the South African physicians where the male physician will work or the female physician will work. And then the husband or wife would be kind of stay at home. Um, you're seeing a big shift in terms of uh, the demographics in medical schools. I think it was one or two years ago where um, the, the female to male ratio actually shifted. So for the first time in terms of medical students, there's more females than males. Uh, and that causes um, concerns that we didn't have before, like maternity leave. Um, how do you manage when the doctor could potentially um, have a, a pregnancy-related complication and need to leave the community at a, at a short short time. Um, you're seeing more and more due to probably simply the admissions processes to get into medical school. You're seeing more urban candidates and one of the factors that does help in terms of rural recruitment is having someone with a rural background. So exposing more kind of young rural students to the idea that you could go you could actually get in and make it in medical school is another area. So when you you look at lifestyle preferences are becoming much more um, of a deciding factor in where physicians will work. Um, some people may argue that um, it's more selfish uh, and people 
people and physicians nowadays, and this is kind of maybe the, the older physician saying it to the younger physicians, but it's less of a profession, it's more of a job. Um, I say that to be purposely controversial. Um, in terms of areas of clinical practice that family medicine residents plan on including in their future practice, you see most, almost all in our study at least, which is only it's a survey of only 22 out of 98, um, currently just starting practice or in training in Saskatchewan. So most are planning on doing some emergencies, some obstetrics, small surgical procedures, the stuff that you would do in the office most likely, um, and then their ambulatory office practice. It's still a broad array of areas that family medicine residents are planning on practicing in. However, when you look at the kind of 18% that aren't planning on doing inpatient hospital medicine, that's worrisome in a, the rural context in that you have to be able to kind of do at least basic inpatient medicine or else you end up transferring all your patients at incredible cost, expense, and difficulty to your patients to larger centers. Um, one of the... One of the, the big things, so this is a picture I took of um, one of the pages or actually had to sign for the first time uh, as the attending physician. So you, you're the boss and in charge, um, but then you can see at the bottom it says signature of MDNP. Um, there's huge cost issues. I know I think in Nova Scotia they've made some major changes to how they provide their healthcare and moving away from like single GPs or single solo practices to more I think, community health networks, I think they're called. Same thing in Ontario. There seems to be a constant, um, constant revision depending on who the government is about kind of uh, fixing the, the rural healthcare problem. At the same time, cost constraints come in. Um, family doctors are expensive. Um, some people have I think in, if there's hopefully a nurse practitioner out there, they can correct me on this, but um, in terms of cost savings, governments have thought that nurse practitioners would be cheaper, um, but they're not, at least in Canada, I believe, they don't bill the same way. So in terms of benefits, um, so a nurse practitioner might get kind of uh, health benefits, whereas physicians, you're essentially, you get nothing other than your billings from the government uh, in most traditional fee-for-service models. So it ends up, the costs end up being about the same. So I'm not sure um, if a, a nurse practitioners are always allowed to practice to the full extent uh, of their scope. Uh, um, there's still, I think, oversight issues in terms of levels of medical care and colleges of physicians. So uh, that's definitely one area that's going to, I guess, get fleshed out more over the next couple of years. Um, where I'm working now, for example, we have four physicians, two NPs, uh, and without the nurse practitioners, I think we would be we'd be overwhelmed, to be honest. Um, uh, and I guess the other thing, I just worked this out this morning, so looking at Canadian numbers, so a rural family doctor, uh, on average, and these are just rough calculations I sketched out here, um, <clears throat> you make about 225000 a year, which sounds pretty impressive, um, but that's your overall cost. Uh, then you also have to kind of out of that, you have to make sure you pay for your clinic, you have to pay for your nurse, your secretary, all of your um, licensing fees. And then you're working, and I worked it out after you paid your 40% tax. Um, you make, if you only only work 60 hours a week, so that would be a normal week plus at least one week on call or one day on call, works out to about $50 an hour, which is not too bad. Um, and I think it's probably the reason physicians probably make that money is because they don't actually have time to spend it. So uh, a 60 hour work week, uh, I think for me would be pretty relaxed. Uh, I would feel that I wasn't actually working enough. I remember there's this odd, I think socialization that happens within medicine where you don't make any plans for probably more than a month in advance because you need to find out when your on call schedule is. Um, long weekends are not necessarily long weekends and you're always hesitant before saying oh, what there's a long weekend coming up because you never know you might be as a resident on call for 48 or 72 hours um, things are changing in that respect but I think it was two years ago we're actually having a beer with someone at a party and I actually came to the realization that there's a lot of people that work Monday to Friday and every Friday at 5 p.m. they're finished and they never ever have to think about work until Monday and for me that was something kind of weird I was like so you have 52 weekends a year off where you don't work 
Um, and I think when doctors <laughs> tend to just hang out with other doctors just as the unsociable hours and um, the way that training is currently, and um, that uh, that was that was just a, a surprise to me. Uh, um, just to come to that kind of realization. Um, going back to the, the research, things that clinical situations that make these younger kind of physicians hesitant to go into rural practice. As I mentioned earlier, lack of uh, specialists being right there. If you think about an urban emergency room, the physician would see them and then have access to say 10 or at least one or two specialists. Um, unexpected obstetrical emergencies, rural deliveries have decreased precipitously. Uh, in Saskatchewan, they don't happen as often in rural areas. There's a little bit of a, not a push, but some pressure maybe to bring back some of these services. But uh, in terms of safety for the newborn or the mom, um, probably um, birth for anything higher risk is going to be better in a regional center where there's an obstetrician or, or a C-section can happen if it needs to in an emergent situation. Um, but there are certain centers, and I've worked in some, where low-risk delivery still happen in the community, um, much higher satisfaction for mom and family and everyone's around. Um, and then obviously mass casualty and occasional massive trauma. And one of the things that we're trying to look at is how often these occasional massive traumas and mass casualty situations happen in rural areas, just to be able to kind of say to training physicians that, look, in reality, it only happens like once a year or on average, you'll have two ambulance visits um, every month in a small center. So that's something that we hasn't really been calculated out and that's one part of our, our future research. Um, in terms of uh, comfortable, like how comfortable residents feel working in rural environments, in terms of working in an office, in terms of working in the hospital, we're finding most of the residents currently training in the system feel quite comfortable. Uh, they're definitely a little bit more hesitant in terms of um, the emergency room or working in an operating room or even in a long-term care home, which is interesting. Uh, in Canada, there's a, a two-year family medicine training program. I believe in the United States, it's three and in Australia, UK, Ireland, you're looking at four to five years. So Canada has the shortest training period in the world for um, a rural generalist family practitioner or urban for that matter. Um, most of our residents are quite comfortable in prevention, health promotion, diagnosis, chronic disease management. Uh, in terms of providing palliative care, which is a bit of a hot topic now, especially in, um, in Canada with uh, medical aid uh, in dying or made. Um, also, also, like medical euthanasia is, I think, the old term. So, made is the new politically correct way to talk about it. So, that's another issue that's going to be coming up. Um, and I'll go back to these are this is a, this is the words of one of my uh, my preceptors when I was training. Um, as we left after two years, try not to kill anyone. Um, so I mean I think that's that's the big fear. You're you're out there. You're a rural physician, um, and you don't want to cause any harm. So do no harm, um, yet with incredible amounts of responsibility. Uh, I won't go into into these next two slides, uh, um, but I'll just go back to there's the book. I did give it one plug already. I'll give it another one there. Um, so it's available on Amazon. It was printed by University of Virginia Press. Um, what it is, is it collects 40 stories, um, so 40 authors from across the country, um, every province, every territory. And the idea actually started when I was working in a small town, Porcupine Plain, uh, in kind of middle eastern Saskatchewan. Uh, and I met this old lady, and she'd come in with this big gash on the front of her shin, and I could hear her as I as I was walking down the hallway saying, oh, you have no need to call the doctor. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And I came in and I had to update her tetanus. And, and as, as I'm stitching her back together and talking to her and chatting and hearing this incredible story of it was a war, war bride and she'd come over to Canada and she was living all on her own at above the age of 90 on the prairies. And she was just going out and putting out milk um, for, her, for her cats. And she ended up chasing away some stray cats. So after I'd stitched her up, I, I wrote, on the, the prescription for her stop chasing stray cats. And that was the original kind of idea for the, for the book was to, to share the incredible stories of, of patients um, that I meet on a, a daily basis in, in rural Saskatchewan. And then the project kind of morphed to be, you know, what is it like 
for not only myself, but are there others out there that kind of are going through the same things I am, being kind of a young rural physician or new out in practice and some of the challenges that you face. Um, and then, and this book, this book came out of it. I had, um, I initially was just going to do just a, an ebook, um, just put it together and quickly publish it. But um, a good friend of mine, uh, who whose story I actually had to cut in the end, messaged me and said, "You know what? This is really a good idea, and you should publish it." So um, this is a, a two-year project that's actually uh, it's done quite well. We're on our second printing now. Um, but uh, I tell you, it's difficult to tell it another physician who told you to write a book and then the book comes out um, and you have to make the phone call to tell him that his story never made it. Um, and so that's it. Um, the, the next book, um, someone joked or quipped that it should be called The Surprising Lives of Small Doctors. So I'll, uh, if anyone is a small doctor listening in, feel free to uh, submit a story for that. So I think that's it. I haven't been able to see uh, anyone's chat window. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. What I'll do, uh, Dr. Dillon, and, and thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, I'm going to, I have actually two small things, two questions of our own actually, or comments rather. Um, and then I'm going to pass it over to, to Misha, one of our students out of our Brandon office um, to what she'll do is she'll read the questions to you once they come in and then maybe you can read them a lot or rather answer them verbally would be would be good and one of the observations I was noticing you mentioned about um, physicians being alone but I also wondered about um, if being a rural doctor perhaps um, is suitable to people who are maybe naturally good at networking or have the certain social skills that require them to kind of be connected to everybody in the community because you do it's it appears that being a rural doctor um, it's not so much that you know you're an ER doctor or you're you know uh, uh, maybe you're a surgeon where you know you go in and you do your surgery um, whereas in a rural context you really do have to know uh, the RCMP, the coroner, or every maybe Tom, Dick, and Harry in the community, and and perhaps that um, that that alone factor as far as not having colleagues, um, that you would perhaps not feel as alone because you're perhaps in in some ways even more connected to the the community in which you work and live. So I don't know about if, if that's a, a good observation, Dr. Dillon, or or if that's a, maybe a positive aspect of Yes, perhaps you are lonely in, in regards to being a lonely physician in a rural context, but perhaps you feel more included in a larger community. Um, I think there's a, there's a couple of issues in there. It's a, it's a great point. I think a huge part of it ends up being the personality of the physician. It can either be a positive or a negative. Some, some physicians might quite like being kind of lonely and having their, their home being their, their castle, and outside of that, they're the physician. Um, others are incredibly deeply embedded in the community and are involved on, you know, like say like this, the school council in addition to their work or they're coaching their sons or daughters team. Um, but there, there is, there is a barrier no matter which side of that kind of personality that you're on <clears throat> that you just, you, you can't discuss the work and you're almost always kind of at work when you're, the physician and you're walking around the grocery store um, you see your patients and you're kind of seeing okay well that person looks better or looks worse um, so you're never re really I think able to turn off in a small town um, because you're always going to see your patients you can't you, you, you can't talk about your work to kind of anyone outside of the circle of care um, and sometimes you know people might ask you oh well how's this person doing and say well I can't comment on that uh, but everybody else in the community already knows because either now through social media, someone's been posting about their emergency visit uh, and you still can't comment on that. Mm -hmm. Everybody else knows. Um, <clears throat> I think if you're not used to a small town, uh, and I think this comes down to where do we pick medical students from? If you're not from a small town, it can be a challenge. Because um, I know when I'm driving down the street, 
within a week of me working in the community, everybody knows that the doctor didn't make a full stop at the one four-way stop in town. Um, everybody's going to know what you put in your shopping basket. Um, so if you're recommending to, to your patients to, to eat healthy and then you're not, then someone's going to walk in and say, well, doc, you can't really tell me to do that. I know you bought two slabs of bacon. <laughs> there, is, there is no off button. You're always on, on, uh, on duty, I guess. Eh? Yeah, and I think um, there was a really interesting panel. I'm married now. Um, three years ago, being, um, being a single family doctor, and you're seeing as you kind of getting your, um, so both males and females who are potentially not married, who go through medical school and then say they want to go into rural practice, um, there is almost no way that you're going to be able to, to want, like find a partner, a life partner, whichever politically correct term you'll use, um, in a small town. So I was on a panel for single rural physicians and the challenges of kind of dating or finding, this is, I guess three years ago when Tinder and all that stuff didn't exist and online dating kind of was just starting. But if you're the physician and want to find someone to, to settle down with, that's incredibly difficult. So there were physicians who would work Monday to Friday and then literally leave the community to go on dates in another community. Because if you're the physician on a date in your town, you can get in the one bar that's in town or the one restaurant, um, you can guarantee that everybody is going to know and everybody's going to talk. Um, so I think it definitely comes down. To yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, and you, you made comment about um, it. It's the difference when you, perhaps you're from that community, and I know um, in Manitoba, for example, in the Manitoba Municipalities Act, it uh, specifically mentions that municipalities can provide special services, uh, thus allocating money or efforts to help recruit or retain some residents. Um, to settle healthcare workers. Uh, I'm currently in Flin Flon, Manitoba right now, and I know I was speaking with the former mayor, and in the past they've also tried to give incentives um, for local residents to go into medicine if they would return back to their community. Um, so in, in your experience too, have some of those efforts or in other areas that you're aware of where they've done certain things on what could municipalities do to help attract more doctors to their community or, or retain some of their current residents to go and, and train and then come back, um, if you have any insight on that? Yeah, one of the things I think that Emmett really pointed out in the, in the research that we're working on now is the effect of financial incentives. Um, there's been huge amounts that have put into kind of either bonuses to come work in small town communities or kind of to, to help relieve the debt load. I think the average debt load of a Canadian um, Canadian med student is something like $135,000 now. Um, when I finished uh, and came back to Canada, my, like, before I got my first ever paycheck at the end was $268,000 Canadian. Um, so there's financial incentives that will work, I think, initially or, or in terms of debt relief. Um, but those, when you realize that a physician is going to make a six figure salary, you still end up with that kind of revolving door where you, you will get people coming in for financial incentive. We've seen the same thing in the military. Um, there's a certain subset of people where financial incentives will work and those financial incentives will work, um, for a short period of time. And then in that subset, a certain, a certain smaller percentage might stay. Um, but it's still a, a stop gap measure. You I think when you mention about recruiting, and I think there have been efforts in this about just exposing the idea of working in, um, working as a doctor in a small town community and exposing that idea to the, the high school students. And then they, <clears throat> part of the problem is, is when they, they go away, they go away to university, that's going to be in a bigger center. Uh, and then the medical schools until the shift of kind of with the, the opening of NOSM or the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and schools with a specific rural focus, then you go away and you're socialized. And so I think there's this aspect of the, the kind of unwritten curriculum in bigger centers. So if you're from a small town and all of a sudden for eight years you're living in the big city uh, um, and everybody around you kind of says, oh, the big city is great, the big city is amazing. Uh, why would you want to go back to your small town? Oh, you're really smart. Why would you go back and work as a just, just, just a family physician in Flin Flon? Uh, and that kind of stuff is not going to be addressed by financial factor. That's part of the like the, the medical school is not probably fulfilling 
their social obligations to a larger province as a publicly funded body. Um, so I think that's, that's probably part of it. And that's going to be one of the trickiest things to do is how do you change an entire kind of culture? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, ex- that's excellent. Um, I guess we, ha- we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Misha. She's going to read the questions aloud. And then, uh, Dr. Dylan, you'll, you'll be able to answer some of those verbally. <laughs> yeah, I'm on two screens. Um, so I do have a question that came in from Ray Bowman. Um, saying thanks for the great stories. Uh, his question is, he didn't recall you mentioning anything about um, the internet or telemedicine. And he agreed that telemedicine can't substitute for the helicopter, but did you have a view of the potential role for telemedicine? Sure. Um, Saskatchewan has some really interesting it's Dr. Ivar Mendez, um, and he's a general surgeon in Saskatoon, and he's been doing some incredible telemedicine stuff, even from I think using a, a Wi-Fi connection in I think it's rural Peru or Ecuador, and have and teaching someone to to do an ultrasound on a patient there while he's looking at it in Saskatoon. And I think he's doing the same thing with Northern Saskatchewan. Having that ability is amazing. Um, just even a, a telephone connection to a specialist that will answer the phone. This used to be an issue 10, 15, say years ago, where you'd, you know, you'd try to call and you wouldn't be able to get the specialist or specialists might not understand the, the rural context. You say, oh, well, you're a doctor. I need this kind of, I need to, to transfer this patient because of this. And the specialist, if they don't understand the rural context, would say, well, why don't you do this? And your answer is simply, well, we don't have a ventilator we don't have any way to do blood work. It's literally me and this patient and I need to, to move them. Saskatchewan, I think, has been really good about this in that the, the urban centers understand what it's like to be a rural physician. But um, they have implemented, and I've seen it now, I believe in Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, and even BC, where before when you would call the specialist, the specialist could say, no, I'm not going to accept this patient. Um, but simply by recording all of the phone calls that are made, um, so that's across Saskatchewan now, they have kind of one line you call to Regina and the calls are recorded. And the uh, the level of politeness between physicians uh, um, has increased incredibly when they know that they're, they're being recorded. Uh, um, and then the decisions that are made, um, second for that. Um, in terms of, uh, like, one of the stories actually in the book, in terms of kind of taking the next level from just phone calls to kind of... Um, video telemedicine. Um, There are now robots and computers where if someone's having a stroke, you can literally aim the camera um, at the patient. The specialist can say, do this exam, so lift up the right arm, lift up the left arm, ask the patient to do this, and then they can see and evaluate and potentially um, provide kind of stroke medication, for example, um, while not, not being on site to a patient that's potentially isolated eight, 12 hours, uh, when you throw in some of the winter storms that we have to deal with, it could be a day before you're able to get the patient out. The downside, I think, not the downside, there's definite cost implications because you're also creating potentially more work. There's a huge amount of technology that is going to need to be implemented, and you're going to need to also have the rural physicians on one end being kind of au fait and being able to run and troubleshoot all of that. Um, you will see definitely, I think, more ultrasound, um, especially in the younger physicians that are coming out to rural areas. Uh, I think there's a lot of informal telemedicine that happens, and, and we pr- probably haven't taken full um, full advantage of that yet, um, even simply kind of text messaging. So I think every, every rural physician, when they go and start practice, still have, have friends that they went to um, medical school with or that they did residency with. Uh, um, and the kind of quick consult or a message over WhatsApp or a text message saying, well, I have this patient, what do you think about this? Uh, I think that happens a lot. Um, there's obviously kind of medical legal implications to those kind of informal consults. Uh, but I think, I mean, I set up something just in this last year on uh, WhatsApp, so an instant messaging kind of platform. So it's about I think, 15 or 16 world doctors across the country. And if we ever have kind of a, a question or we're just wondering, oh, is this okay? Or what should I do with this patient? Um, we can um, uh, just send a, send a quick message and you know, with all the different time zones, someone else is gonna be awake and can kind of give second thoughts on it. 
Okay, so I did have another question as well. Um, someone saying thank you for all the information. Um, and they were just asking if you have to go through the SIPA program uh, or see arms to be eligible to work in small towns. So this is a, it's, it's, there's a provincial, I guess, kingdom um, for each path for, I guess, foreign training physicians to come into Canada. Um, there are some national exams. So in my case, I trained, I did an undergraduate degree in Canada. I did my medicine in Ireland, worked for two years. I did a master's uh, and some other postgraduate training in Europe. And then eventually I got in to um, a Canadian residency program. So I wasn't fully trained when I came back. I still had to go through a residency. Um, so in terms of how many times I applied to Canada, I applied to get back. I'm born in Canada, so Canadian um, citizen, but I applied five times. Um, so that was two and a half years of kind of working. And um, like I wrote two other books. I did a master's. Um, and at that stage, you're kind of a doctor, but you're a doctor in name only only. Um, so I, I worked and applied and applied and applied again and again and again. Um, <clears throat> I wrote my Canadian exam. So I wrote my, there's three of them. I think there was a Medical Council of Canada evaluating exam, which is only for um, doctors trained overseas. Then I did the qualifying one exam, qualifying two exam. I wrote my U.S. exam. So three part U.S. assembly one, two, three over the course of three years. I wrote those exams and passed all of those. Um, I think someone asked for my scores, probably not great, or I would have got in on the first time. Um, and then I also wrote my um, UK exam. So I, I flew to Pakistan to write one half of the exam. I wrote the other one in London. Um, so I, I did all of my exams. I think a lot of people, um, especially now when you think about the, the numbers, like, like there's, there's more Canadians, uh, this stat statistic was correct two years ago, I think. There's more Canadians studying in medical schools overseas than there are in Canada. So there's literally probably thousands, there's probably at least, yeah, easily a thousand Canadians that are in overseas medical schools now. Uh, and there's simply not enough spots to train them when they come back. Part of it is a resource issue. Part of it is just a, a cost containment issue. Um, and then and if we were to solve all the, the rural healthcare problems by having family physicians there, um, family physicians are a very expensive part of the healthcare kind of package. Um, and governments probably don't really want to solve that problem because that's a huge cost to the government and taxpayers um, downstream. So there is probably a bit of uh, resource cost containment. And uh, this is, especially in terms of, I guess, voters, um, it is an issue, but it's an issue that if in the next electoral cycle I can seem to solve it a little bit, I might get reelected. Um, and I don't think that the appetite is really there to hire huge numbers of, of new physicians. And um, I think there's huge numbers of, of, of different parties that are involved in that decision to finally get a physician working in a, a rural area. You have the provincial colleges of licensing, you have the universities, you have the, um, the training bodies, the continuing medical education training bodies, you have the family physician licensing, you have the I guess you can call it the medical student lobby. You're going to have the family doctors and training lobby. Um, and everyone has their own interests. Um, but there's no one overall that's really looking at the, the big picture. And the federal government is going to have their own interests. And the provincial government is going to have their own interests as well. Um, I've actually seen a couple of comments that asked about how to get into an RDI job. Um, I think the, there's been, I can see Michael's got a little chuckle. Um, I think there's been maybe a little bit of a misunderstanding that um, we have facilitated the webinar, but RDI is the Rural Development Institute, so it's not specifically medically related. So that's me trying to answer that question. Um, although we did have some, some other questions asking about, uh, you know, what the requirements would be to be accepted as a world family doctor in Saskatchewan, um, or what someone could do to get into a uh, Canadian rural family medicine program um, to help with uh, the issue of fewer physicians in rural areas. So I think a lot of the questions have kind of overlapped a little bit, and I'm not sure how best you might want to tackle those. Um, um, I guess 
I can speak broadly about her. I mean, the, the it's hugely competitive. Um, I think my experience was probably the, the tip of the iceberg. If I had applied five years earlier, I think I probably would have gotten in just simply because the, num the numbers game at that stage was that um, if you wanted to go work in rural medicine, you could kind of write your ticket to go wherever you wanted. Um, the amazing thing that I've seen over the last five years is some of these rural programs that um, I can use my, my, my Regina example. So for example, there would be 10, 10 resident physicians that were accepted kind of out of medical school um, to train in family medicine for two years. I think the year before me, there was one Canadian and nine international, whether they're CSAs like myself, a Canadian who studied abroad medicine or an IMG international medical graduate, there would have been one Canadian and nine, I believe, international. Um, then in my year, I think there was three Canadians, so people who study in Canadian med schools, and seven internationals. Then three years, I think there was one, and it was a Saskatchewan guy who had gone overseas and come back. So the years ago, the Canadian medical schools, and in terms of projecting um, future need for physicians, had these massive increases in medical students. So government said, we need more doctors, and how do you start you? You know, it's a nice, easy, um, uh, a nice, easy way to kind of get votes and say, we're opening up and expanding the medical schools from 120 to 240. Downstream, the effect of that is, is they didn't increase kind of the number of training spots. So those training spots that would have potentially been open to international medical graduates or Canadians that studied abroad, all of a sudden are kind of filled with Canadian graduates, which is probably, if you're looking at it from the ethical standpoint of stealing, from, stealing taking physicians from other countries and in areas that still need physicians, um, was probably a, a good thing. But um, I mean, the demand for residency training spots um, greatly outstrips the actual um, spots that are available. Um, there's also kind of just the more general question of what is one of the best things that you consider about being a rural physician? Um, I think I'm a pretty positive person, but I love the fact that um, like my keys, I just went to the hospital this morning, came back, the keys are still like in the car outside. I know that um, everybody else is all like, everybody looks out for each other. Um, and I think in an urban center, you can kind of live in a, a condominium or something and never really know your neighbors. And whereas here, if you walk down the street, you're going to say hi. Um, there's, I think, I don't know if you call it the Saskatchewan wave. I think it's across all kind of small towns. You're driving on a gravel road and you're driving by someone and you wave. It's just a, a friendly hello. And you know that, you know what, if you've got an accident, the next person driving by is not going to drive by and look and Glock, they're going to get out of the truck, they're going to make the phone calls, they're going to wait there with you, they're going to drop you off to the next place wherever you're going. And then as, as, a, as a physician, you have this um, incredible way of really helping the community. Uh, if a community loses the physician, all of a sudden it's this extra layer of kind of subconscious worry if something happens, especially as rural Canada ages, um, where is that kind of lifeline? Um, and even myself, as I've gotten older, I kind of when you're 25, you don't think about, oh, how, how's my health going to be? Or I don't need to be near a hospital. But as you get older, you kind of realize, mm, you know what? If there's a hospital close by and a doctor there, uh, you're just a little bit, I think, happier and safer. Um, so for me, I think it's just the, the sense of community. Um, and that's something that I think you lose when you move into kind of a, a more urban center. There's a little bit more of a, a connection to each other, a social connection. Um, I guess then there's just one last little thing. Somebody was saying as um, being a lonely WFD, uh, does one have to be on call 24-7? Sorry, being a lonely? What does WFD mean? Um, I believe they mean world family doctor. Oh, okay. And sorry, say the question um, again. So somebody anonymously, just as maybe uh, a last kind of question, because I think you've tackled a lot of uh, a lot of the questions that were posed was just somebody saying um, being in that position does somebody have to be on call 24 7 like it sounds very demanding being in a rural um, area um, I think if if you're not you're probably not fulfilling um, the full scope of your role um, and now you don't have to do it the longest I've done I think was 16 days in a smaller town so I wasn't 
called out constantly, but I mean, you do, I mean, you need someone there for emergencies, emergencies. And I think a huge part of it is um, the nursing colleagues that you work with, um, if they've been there and are experienced, they know to kind of protect the doctor because it's kind of, it's a, it's a limited resource. If you're the physician and you are on call 24 um, seven and you're not getting, you know, more than two hours or one hour sleep in a row after three or four days, um, you're not going to be practicing to kind of the highest level and you're going to be exhausted and on coffee. And I think when you look at physician burnout and physician suicide, um, like you, you just won't last. You can, I thought I could do it forever, but even now I quite enjoy getting like six hours sleep uninterrupted. Um, so I think you do need to be there for emergencies, but there's always kind of most of the towns I work in, there'll be a nurse that'll be on call. And if someone comes in for something that, you know, is not urgent and they're not going to die, they're not going to get worse. And, um, a sore ear can wait, you know, six more hours until the morning when you come in at eight o'clock or seven o'clock. Um, you're, I think you're protected that way. I mean, otherwise you will get physicians burning out. And that's part of the reason why physicians might not want to work in rural areas is for that lifestyle for, for the selfish issue of lifestyle. They may want to spend time with their kids or they may want to, to kind of sleep for eight hours a night. So they might shift to a more urban practice where they work kind of nine to five Monday to Thursday and have, you know, three days off. So you do make, I think the sacrifice coming to a rural community is those like you're never going to, well, you might on occasion have a weekend off where you finish on, on Friday. But I mean, for example, here I was off this last weekend at a 24-hour call on Friday. It was done at 8 a.m. and then we had uh, an emergency where the physician called me. And so even though I was going to go to the, the Fort Smith Paddle Fest local community dance with my wife and just like hang out um, for an evening, I got called back at 11 o'clock and was there till 2 a.m. on a Saturday. So even if you're off call, I think it's part of the profession that if something happens, you go back in. I mean, there's there's not a physician in the country that's going to say no I'm on my day off I'm not going to come in for the emergency um, so yeah it is tough but it's part of it's part of the job and then uh, I think it's fulfilling to be I mean what other profession can you say that you know I had to go in and save someone's life um, or save the limb so we saved the, we saved the leg this weekend which is pretty awesome Um, I guess I'll sneak in with one last question, and then um, I see that Michael is unmuted now. Um, but okay, so one last uh, comment was um, somebody saying thank you again for the presentation. Um, it appears that most medical students are from urban centers in our province. As mentioned about high school students coming from a rural background to an urban center for training, do you see for do you, pardon me, foresee a future where there will be a larger representation in medical schools of those raised rurally versus urban? I'd like to say yes, um, but I don't see it. Um, I think the, the, the way medical school admissions have kind of gone, um, you really need to be getting really high marks um, in, a, in a good university. Um, probably have parents that can help you go on um, go on trips, um, volunteer, um, and be able to kind of build that resume. Um, and it's unfortunate that you need to kind of build a resume to get in. Once you're in medical school, you're in, and it's kind of t the ticket. It's very difficult to get kicked out, but it's very hard to get in. Um, and as when I, I've, I've seen this actually in some of the small towns, um, in Saskatchewan, you have someone who's thinking about doing it, but you know they have to help out on their dad's farm every other minute, and that's not something that um, I think shows on necessarily a resume. I mean, there's no say. Say you're in a bigger center and you're you know you're you're captain of your um, local community football team. Well, you know what? In in a small town, there isn't necessarily going to be five, ten different things that you can do to kind of show that you're a well-rounded candidate. So. I think that's probably a, a problem and issue of the, the medical school selection process, but the quality of applicants is so high, I think they're in a very difficult position into how do you tell someone who's potentially really well qualified to be a, a cardiac surgeon and has done this, that, and the other, they're probably an astronaut in their spare time in an urban center, um, how are they better qualified when you're the person on the selection committee? Uh, and I think this comes back to the different influences. Um, people on a, a selection committee have a very difficult, difficult 
time because they're trying to make a decision six years before the person will go into practice um, about potentially kind of the, the social or the societal implications of where these physicians will practice. Uh, and it's such a long kind of lag time from when someone gets into medical school to a decade later in probably the most most kind of volatile in your 20s when you don't necessarily know what you're going to kind of do or you don't have a partner or you might have kids along the way. Uh, it's a very, very tricky, difficult decision to make. Um, I don't think I ever want to sit on, a, on an admissions committee because you're, you're playing God, playing, deciding, you know, what people's lives are, are going to be like in their entire career. Well, thank you for answering all of the questions, um, Dr. Dillon. Uh, I'm not sure if Michael has anything to add at this point. No, I, I, uh, I was also very um, impressed and thankful. Um, that was excellent. And especially, uh, I was very impressed with the attendance. We had 50 people attend today, which is normal. That's one of our largest um, webinars uh, that we've had this year. We had another one this year as well that were 50. So it really speaks to the importance um, and level of interest that uh, a lot of people have in solving this issue of uh, rural medicine and uh, getting physicians there and, and life of rural physicians. So I appreciate uh, Dr. Dillon's uh, comments and presentation today because I think it was very, very worthwhile. All right, yeah, thank you so much. I have, to, I have my next patient in about 50 minutes, so I'm going to have to run off. No problem. <laughs> So I'll, I'll but, just close uh, things yeah. up. Yeah, I'll close things up for those who are viewing um, as Dr. Dylan logs off. I thank you for your time today. Um, a video of the webinar will be posted to the RPLC uh, YouTube site. Uh, we'll also be sending you an, a survey by email, and please take the time to complete the survey as it helps us improve and identify future webinar topics. Um, and for anyone not already on our RPLC email list, please visit the Rural Policy Learning Commons website and sign up for information such as upcoming webinars, newsletters, and upcoming rural-related events. Uh, the RPLC is an international network of institutions and uh, to help support development of rural policy. Uh, our next webinar will take place on September 20, where a panel of RPLC members will highlight the State of Rural Canada report. Uh, the timing of this webinar is uh, very, um, it, it's, it's perfect timing um, because we also have a conference coming up, uh, which is the SURF Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation and the RPLC are holding a uh, annual conference in Guelph, Ontario in October. Um, so the State of Rural Canada report will go over a lot of stuff that uh, will be definitely discussed at at our conference, which is happening in Guelph. Uh, to register for the webinar or for information on our conference that's happening in October, please feel free to email myself, blatherwickm at brandonu.ca, and we'll be able to send you the information that you need. And just as a reminder, today's webinar was brought to you by the Rural Development Institute at Brandon University, uh, one of the key founders and partners um, for the Rural Policy Learning Commons. So thanks again for everyone for tuning in. And we'll uh, end recording now and uh, look forward to seeing everyone next time. Thanks.